Hello, I'm Paul Rosa, and in a few moments we're going to catch up with Walter Koenig. Now you probably know Walter as Chekhov on the popular Star Trek television and film series. What you may not know is that although he appreciates the fame from Star Trek, he'd rather be known for his ability as a versatile actor and as an author. Stay tuned as we have a conversation with Walter Koenig. Okay, Walter, let's start with Babylon 5. You've made a guest appearance and you're going to be reappearing. Yeah, um, Babylon 5 was a terrific experience. I was uh, treated very well. In Star Trek, most of the time, you know, I'm there as an expository character, someone who just relates information. Babylon 5, I was a principal character. Yeah, first lead. Yeah, well, it was second lead, but still it was an important character. And uh, it, was, it was truly a great fun. I enjoyed working with the other actors. Uh, Michael O'Hara and, and, and Jerry and, uh, and, and, and the ladies involved. And uh, it was the kind of uh, experience that every actor should have every time they work. Mm -hmm. I was at a convention recently and everybody who came up to me uh, also commented on Babylon 5 and how much they enjoyed it. Now it was a darker character. Yeah. yeah. We've all, you know, there are times when we all get angry and we all feel uh, impatient and we all feel uh, arrogant to a degree, and um, those feelings are there in the character I played, Bester, and it was nice to be able to draw upon that. Instead of always be twinkling and, you know, and smiling, it's, uh, it's nice to, to explore the other parts of one's personality. Now you were telepathic in that character, mm -hmm. and you did that little mind I knew you were going to ask to say that. Thing. Yeah. Did you feel like maybe you were getting a little too Spock-like, I mean, your character? I, I, mm, no, Spock it really isn't telepathic, he's got to do a mind melt, you know, he's got to stick his fingers up somebody's neck. Uh, no, you know, you have to, the, the thing is this, you know, particularly when you work in science fiction, but actually in any role you play, you have to accept, accept the circumstances. You got to, you can't, you can't stand back and critique them and say, oh, this is silly, or this is impossible. You have to say, yes, I'm going with this. Because if you don't go with it, if you don't accept what's happening and believe in it, then the audience isn't going to believe it. Once you step before the cameras, you've got to accept it. You've got to accept everything that you're doing as being real. Otherwise, it'll show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as a matter of fact, I made a certain um, adjustment on the character that no one, I don't think one person in a million will be aware of. Perhaps in future episodes, they will. And that is, I made my left hand frozen. My, I couldn't, I, I, my left hand was a, a fist. And what it did for me was, was to give me this sense of physical impairment that made it even more important that I be strong Cerebral. mentally. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it, you know, it, it, in a, some kind of strange way, it helps that I was actually smaller than everybody else. Because again, that immediately says, well, if he's in command, then he must have something going on. J. Michael Straczynski. Uh, I met him at a convention, did an interview. Seemed like a very nice guy. He's a terrific guy. How is he to work with? He's, he's wonderful. Uh, he's the... He's the creator. The creator. Executive producer, yeah. Co-executive producer. He wrote that character for me, is what it amounted to. And I think it's interesting that he had... that he knew better than I uh, that I could play this character. And... Uh, Chekhov has been a bad guy on a few occasions. Yeah, yeah, but more, you know, with a sneer and the, the phaser pointed. Just on that one, the de on the uh, Star Trek Two Rathacon with. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Star Trek Two and Mirror Mirror. Yeah, I forgot about Star Trek Two. Yeah. Mirror Mirror was not as much uh, fun, I thought, watching you perform as it was in Star Trek Two. You yeah. had some fun stuff there, and the whole ensemble that was not a big part, but it was a big part with Ricardo and all the bad guys. Yeah. Well, it was it was just it was really a really a neat experience working with Ricardo de Montalban and Paul Winfield. Um, getting away from having to uh, take third 
or fourth place in a scene, uh, you know, when it was aboard the bridge, uh, um, being able to really share equally in a scene was, was lovely. And Ricardo, uh, f you know, for all of his history as, as a movie star, uh, was, uh, and, and he's, he's very flamboyant and very, you know, he's bigger than life. Regal. Very regal. Uh, for all of that, he was, he, was, um, he was there for you. He was there for you as an actor. There was no ego. There was no ego to contend with, nor with Paul Winfield. They were there as professional actors to do their job. We'll talk more about Star Trek, but there's so much more that you're doing. We, we, uh, we just went to a play you were in last night with your wife. Yeah. Yeah, my wife, Judy Levitt. Uh, we did a um, concert reading of an abridged version of the H.G. Wells novel, The Time Machine. We did it as a benefit performance to raise money for a theater company. At last, I made it to the surface and staggered out into the blinding light. I fell upon my face. Even the soil smelt sweet and clean. Oh, Weena, I think I now know why you are so afraid of these Morlocks. There is something malign about them. I need some kind of weapon if I'm going to go back and get my machine. It worked really well. Yeah, thought, you know. uh, several people said afterwards, you could hear a pin drop during the performance. Right, exactly. Um, that despite the fact that we, uh, we were working with literally very little movement or no movement. Did you have fun doing it? Yeah, yeah, again, a different kind of a guy. You've directed a lot of projects. I've done, I directed some, quite a, a considerable amount of theater. I haven't done any, I haven't directed anything with a camera involved, but I have directed theater. I, Beckett and um, uh, 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 Hotel Paradiso and America Hurrah, uh, lot, projects that are, you know, really range over a, a broad spectrum in terms of style. Everything from, from presentational uh, theater to uh, uh, farce to drama. You enjoy directing farce. Yeah, yeah, I, I truly do. I think you, you, there's so much latitude you have when you direct farce. There's a lot of creativity involved. Who are your favorite playwrights? I don't know if I have a favorite playwright uh, in, in terms of farce. If I, you know, Hotel Paradiso is by Fedu, and uh, I, I had a terrific time directing that. I like Arthur Miller a great deal. Uh, I want to do um, a Death of a Salesman as an actor. And I think I'm approaching the age where I can handle that. Do you have any desire to direct a film or TV the, show? The only film things that I would be interested in directing were things that I had written myself. Yeah. Why do you think Leonard wanted to do it so bad? He I did think, it really well, too. Yes, he did. I think he wanted to explore another facet of his uh, talent. Uh, it was another area of creativity. Um, he'd, he'd been directing long before he directed Star Trek. He'd, he'd done television episodes. He had directed television. And of course he had directed in the theater and he had taught in the theater. So I'm sure that he felt he had a contribution to make. Do you think he did? Oh yeah. I think he, was, he did a very good job. Uh, Leonard directs by omission. If he doesn't say anything, you're doing well. You know, only, so it's only when he, st he speaks to you about what you've done that you know you're in trouble. Was that a good way to go? It was, once I understood it, once I understood that he wasn't upset and he was, you know, and he was... Uh, nothing is good, nothing is yeah, good. biting his tongue. When, when I realized that that's the way he worked, that was fine. Mm -hmm. Bill, on the other hand, you know, is all over you. He's very effusive and, and full of praise. I, I mean, you say, I, sir, Walt, good. That was good. I just thought it was good. <laughs> okay. And it, got, it got, a little, got a little, you know, a little embarrassing after a while. I mean, really, you'd say, you'd say two words and he would make you feel like you were up for a nomination for an Academy Award. That could make it hard, couldn't it? If, if you don't, how much good is good enough? Yeah, well, it, I suppose it could make it difficult if, you know, if he had no, if he had no eye and, and, you know, and was simply saying everything was great and it wasn't. But no, he, he was, I think he was a good director. Um, what do you think it's of uh, five? I think the work he did was, was uh, I think it was very uh, efficient and, uh, and, and uh, did as well as, as, as the material dictated. Okay, well, let's talk about his book then. He came to see you about it? He came to see me, he sat here for two hours with a tape recorder uh, and asked me, uh, you know, what went wrong and what I felt about all our years together. 
and I explained to him that uh, that my 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 primary concern was that he was he had, was totally desensitized to the people around him, and he was constantly restaging and reblocking and changing lines. Uh, and I and I explained to him, that, you know, and I gave him chapter and verse of where he had done this over. And I, I told him, in fact, that it became a gag on the, on the films. Uh, Nick Meyer would come in full of you know enthusiasm and ebullience and uh, energy and saying, okay, this is what we're going to do today. You're going to be here and you're going to be there and Bill, you're going to be there. And he would set the whole, the, whole, the, the scene up and uh, there would be a, a moment why, uh, when we would all turn kind of surreptitiously and look at Bill out of the corner of our, our eye and he'd be going, Nick. And then he would take him aside and they He'd come back and the scene would be restructured, it would be restaged. And no longer was Bill back there, Bill was up here. You know, it was that, it was that kind of thing. Do you like Chekhov? Do you, are you glad you did Chekhov? Oh, that? sure, sure. I don't think I could have come back so many times if I didn't like him. In fact, I like him too much. Because what, I, what I'd like, I, you know, I, I, want this, I want to reveal him. I want, I want, the, I want to have a chance to, to really get inside of him and, and express what he's thinking. And, you know, and, and most of the time that wasn't possible. Um, when I went in for the, on this ne on the Next Generation movie, um, my, they sent me a script and my first reaction was, this is, the, the character is written, is there purely for expository purposes. Simply to, ex to, to explain plot. Plot development. Right. Yeah. It just wasn't worth it to me to be there just to have my face on the screen and my name. In the credits. You know, uh, and I explained to them that what I needed was this was a sense of first person pronoun. There, you know, in other words, Chekhov had to say something other than just story point. How does Chekhov feel about something? It was a very. I'll give you an example. There was a moment where I'm talking to Sulu's daughter, and I say, and the purpose of the scene was in, to introduce his daughter to Kirk, so that Kirk could say, when did Sulu have an opportunity? When did he have a chance to have a family? And uh, Jimmy says, "Well, you've been, you know, hopping around the galaxy for so long. You know, you never took the time." So it was a, it was it was a, a Kirk scene, an introspective moment on Kirk, and it remained that. But I said, I, "I'd like a line there where I can turn to her and say, uh, your father would be very proud of you, or must be very proud of you.' That does not have anything to do." With, with, with Captain Kirk. No, because you, your character Chekhov was friends with Sulu. Yeah, so it's a very simple thing. It's one. It's just one sentence, but it immediately it's coming from Chekhov, you know. It, 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 it's, he's no. He's no longer furniture. Exactly. He's got a character. Right. Uh, Some history. Yeah, and that you know that kind of personal comment is what I was looking for, yeah. and we found three or four different places yeah. where we could do that, and it was enough to satisfy me. You know, to say, okay, I, I'll be happy to be a part of this. So do you like the script to Seven? Uh, there's a lot of good character stuff. I mean, uh, Data is written for Data and uh, right, down, right down the line. Uh, everybody has material that is indigenous to their character, and I think in fun, in fun situations. The, the, the story uh, uh, revolves on a fantasy element. Not, yeah, I've heard that. Not a science fiction as much as a fantasy element. And whether that is totally consistent with, uh, with the Star Trek universe is, is open to conjecture. And you don't have to scream in this one? No, but I asked them for another moment. I asked them for an emotional moment. Uh, you don't want to scream, though? No, I don't want to scream. No, I, because already, uh, somebody's already chiseled uh, a gravestone that says, here lies Walter Koenig, better known as Pavel Chekhov, he screamed good. You know, and, and I, I, I don't want them to actually erect that on my grave. I, it's, it's there, it's waiting, and I want, I want something else. This is me at 17. I was co-captain on my high school track team. This is uh, from a television anthology series called The Great Adventure. This is Walter Koenig in 1962. The man who's playing my father in this and this photograph is, and in the show, was Lee Marvin. 
We were Armen Armenian grape pickers. Lee Marvin was great fun to work with. He was uh, very much a man's man, and uh, I thought it was great that, uh, I mean, I was a kid, really, starting out, and he treated me like, you know, a veteran, one of the old, you know, one of the, one of the old guys, and I, I really liked that. I felt very complimented by that. This is from an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour called Memos from Purgatory, written by Harlan Elson, who also uh, wrote the City on the Edge of Forever for uh, Star Trek. I played the leader of a gang, and they were my henchmen. And I was sort of the baby-faced, the psychopathic uh, killer. This is a theatrical pro production called The Deputy. Uh, it was about a priest in Germany who helped uh, the Jews and the gypsies and the homosexuals to escape, uh, or try to escape from the, from the Nazis and ended up going to the oven, uh, ovens with them. Uh, this is from an, another production that I really had a great time doing. This is from uh, Steam Bath. Um, and I played God as a Puerto Rican towel attendant. I've got to tell you, while we were setting up, you were setting up by uh, your... <laughs> and I screamed in there. <laughs> and there was Chekhov in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I'm not talking about Walter Canning. I'm talking about no, I the actor. The actor. Do, do you, in real life, do you, is that your release, that little... Once in a while, once in a while. Since the, uh, the heart episode, as we euphemistically say, um, I, have, I have tried to be a little bit more calm, a little bit less uh, um, prone to excessive emotional behavior. You have scared people. It was pretty serious. Quadruple bypass. I had a oh, quadruple okay. bypass, yeah. And how have you been feeling? I've been feeling great. I've been feeling great. That, doesn't, that doesn't mean that I, uh, that, I, I have no, that I have forgotten about it or that it isn't a part of my consciousness. It is, it, it is a part of my consciousness. Uh, hopefully that you know, as time goes by and I, ha I experience no adverse uh, reaction, uh, it'll become less. But certainly it has affected my life. What have you changed? Well, it's not so much that what I've changed as a feeling that I have. I now have a sense of fatality uh, that I, I didn't have. Uh, it's probably 10 years earlier than I, that I would have ordinarily had it. And now I, I feel an, an, you know, a certain urgency to move ahead with different projects. Tell me about some of them. Well, the most important project is a novel that I'm writing. Yeah, you talked about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's called The um, the Man Who Wasn't There. And uh, I have 90 pages done. It was, it was 60 pages of story and a 30-page outline of the, in, of the entire book. I'll give you what, what prompted the story. And, I, and here again, I was thinking about it for years. It's a wonderful title. Yeah, well, I was thinking about it for years and never did anything about it uh, until this thing with the heart. Um, my, I'd come home from a convention, from being out of town, and I'd say to myself, what would happen if I woke up the next morning and found out that the plane I had come in on had crashed, had never made it to Los Angeles? Now, that to me was a very interesting idea. How do you do that without making it science fiction or fantasy or horror or whatever? How do you do that and make it possible. And f f for years, I couldn't, I couldn't find a way. And then it finally occurred to me how I could do it. And um, when I had that in mind, I then started to work backwards from that idea as to how he came to this place and, and what, it, what it meant and who he was. Because he thinks he's somebody that he isn't, my character. Sounds interesting. Yeah, it's a, and it's, it's, it's kind of labyrinth, labyrinthian and convoluted. But it works, and I made it work, uh, uh, you know, uh, satisfactory. Uh, obviously, because uh, so people who've read it so far, you know, feel that it's an interesting story. A page turner is the way it's been described to me. That's great. And so it's I'm a novel. It's, it's a be... novel. It's going to be a novel, and I'm, I think, I think that if I got that done, I mean, got it published, hardcover, the whole, the whole schmear, uh, I would feel at that point that I had succeeded at something um, that I could really feel some pride in, and something that had, that had some endurance beyond simply having been a member of, a, of the cast of Star Trek. Of a legend, 
really. But it, a but classic. A, yeah, right. The, the, the Star Trek is a classic. But and this I, would be yours. You yeah, would this would own be mine. It. Right, right. You would own it. Yeah, exactly. That's, a, that's about the best way to put it, exactly the way I feel. Let's talk about how you got to Star Trek. People want to know. Well. And, and in Bill's book, he said they needed a monkey on the ship. They needed one <laughs> of the monkeys. <laughs> yeah, I told him that story. I mean, that's where he got it from. Yeah, for the people who haven't, who oh. don't know what we're talking about, Bill says in his book that they needed to appeal to the younger audience, that the monkeys had become a big hit series about, uh, it was basically a spinoff off the Beatles, really. The monkeys right. were the American Beatles. And when you look at the pictures of Chekhov, the first pictures, you had a monkey haircut. There's for, that's well, that for was, sure. I had a monkey hairdo yeah. and a monkey uh, wig. So that was a wig. The first six shows I did was a, was a wig that they got from Max Factor. Uh, yeah, they wanted somebody who would appeal to the to young crowd. Uh, did they tell you that? I think it was self-evident. It was pretty okay. much self-evident. Um, so what were you thinking? Oh, good, I got a job. I mean, what was going through your head at that time? I, I oh, good, I had a job for a week. It was going through my head. I was not uh, put under contract. Mm -hmm. I was said that if it works out, you know, if they like if they, if they like what I do, they'll have me back, and they told me that there was the possibility of my recurring. Uh, actor learns not to put a lot of store in that. Often they tell you that when they want to get you for short money, you know. And my audience was basically the 8 to 14 year olds, you know, 8 years old to 14 year olds. I got a lot of letters uh, on uh, line paper and pencil saying that I was groovy. Uh, and and th that's... That, was that fun? Yeah, it was great fun. I was getting... Uh, Seven, eight hundred letters a week, which was a considerable amount, considering that you know Bill and, and Leonard had an enormous amount of mail uh, themselves. So it was hard, it was, it was hard to uh, hard to. Uh, I mean, they were getting such a such a majority of it that one wouldn't think there was anything left. But I, I was getting. Uh, Did a you have any uh, run-ins with with uh, young teenage idol fans? No, up? it was all very mild. I mean, yeah. the, the, bear in mind, as I say, these are really young kids. Okay. Eight years old, nine years old, ten years old, up until fourteen. In fact, the mail started to fall off when they realized one that I wasn't really Russian, and two that I was married. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, oh. And, and that was in the third season. It started. I, I was starting to lose that audience. Uh, I don't know if they knew at that point that I was thirty-two and not twenty-two, um, because that's the way I was presented on the show. Well, in the third season, your hairstyle changed, and you got to be intelligent and have things going on. <laughs> You, you know, you didn't scream as much, and you were yeah. a contributor yeah. more so. so. Let's talk about some of the friendships you've made through Star Trek. Mark Leonard. Mark and I have a, an interesting relationship. Uh, we've done uh, three plays together. Two short plays, uh, Box and Cox, uh, which was by Sullivan, of Gilbert and Sullivan. It was a farce, a very f funny, strange play. Where did play. you do that? Uh, we did it first in a workshop okay. uh, here in Los Angeles. It was the West Coast Ensemble, I think it was called, something like that, West Coast Theater Ensemble. And then we took it to a couple of, we did it at Cypress College, we took it on the road a couple of times, in conjunction with another play called Actors by Conrad Bromberg, about a younger actor and an older actor. They, they were, this Actors particularly was very, conducive to transport. We, we were able to do that at conventions, just on a, uh, in, in a ballroom. Was it a two-person? Two-person, uh, well, actually, there was, a, there was three people. Uh, there was a third character. When we did it in Los Angeles, uh, Judy, my wife, uh, played the other part. And, but when we took it on the road, we used somebody in the local uh, fan club, the Star Trek fan club, to do it. And then Mark came, uh, Mark found The Boys in Autumn, and uh, he had seen it in New York with George C. Scott and John Collum and thought we, we'd be very right for that. I found the director out here, a gentleman that I had known for many years, Alan Hunt, and uh, he, uh, he uh, directed it and I, I staged it in Los Angeles for a six-week run and then we took, and we've taken it on the road subsequently. We played it at a convention in Denver and a convention in Chicago and also at legitimate theater venues uh, in, in, in various locations. You like the stage. I love the stage. I love the stage. What's different about the stage? Well, it's an opportunity to sustain character. And there's that wonderful electric feeling of working before a live audience. You know, they're there. It's, you know, 
it's, um, I guess it's very much like uh, the thrill a stuntman gets when he, when he takes a risk, you know, when he dives off a, a building or something. Every time you, you're, you know, you're working in front of a live audience, you're taking a risk. You know, that you could, you could bomb, you could forget your lines, you know, something could happen. Uh, and that is exciting. It's like living on the edge. It really is. After one of your films is done, do you go see it with an audience? Do you like sneak into a theater and watch it? I guess I've done that with each of the pictures uh, once. I, I, I don't think I've seen any of the films more, more than twice, twice at the most. Uh, I don't know why. I just, it, it grows old very quickly for me. And, and immediately I, it, you know, I place it in the category of something that has been, that is done. Okay, now that's done. There's no, there's no fun in dwelling in the past, you know, even if it's only three months before. It's time to go on to something else. Are you always on your next project? Is that how you work? I try to think that way. I try to think that way. Don't I try you to... ever sit back and smell the roses and say, this was great, I'm proud of myself? I mean, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that you're always one step ahead of yourself. Well, I think, you know, one of the, one of the elements that is, that, are in, that is intrinsic to being an actor, not every actor, I don't mean to generalize and blanket every every performer with this, with this statement, but certainly I think it's, it is uh, uh, critical to the personality of, of many performers, is a sense of insecurity and a sense of that you have to continue to prove yourself to yourself. At least that's the way I feel. I, uh, that was fine. I'm, I'm glad it was successful. I'm glad it worked. Uh, but what have I done for me lately? What is it that makes you feel successful? You are successful when... When the work... When I know that the work is good and the work is challenging. And I've got to say, although I don't like to admit it, when other people tell me it is too. I mean, I'd like to be able to say that all I need is my own... Uh, my own uh, sense of uh, self-worth, you know, and, and, that, and, that, and that's all I... You know, I'd be satisfied. That isn't true. I need, I need the support of others. And people, when people I respect commend the work, then I feel that I have achieved something. Are you having fun? I don't know if it's really within, I don't know if it's in my personality to really have fun over an extended period of time. Uh, I, I, I had been told that I'm not really happy unless I'm anxious, unless I think things are going uh, wrong. You know, you, you, people have certain orientations. It's like, you know, an animal learns to live in a cage and then you open the cage door and it doesn't climb out, you know, because that's, that's its home. Uh, it's his lair. Well, I think a certain s angst, a certain kind of uh, concern and worry uh, are part of my makeup. It may have, uh, you know, indirectly been partially responsible for uh, my heart problems, for all I know. It's, because I live with a, a degree of stress, and the stress doesn't have to be there. It's not something that other people are providing in my life. It's something that I have come to expect and have come to feel. I know comfortable sounds like a peculiar word to, to apply to this, but I think really that's what it is. I'm, I'm, it's, it's what I know. You know, this kind of anxiety, this kind of stress is what I know, and if I don't have it, I become anxious, you know. You know, a lot of actors, the, 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 it seems like a lot of the people that I've talked to around Star Trek feel that way. Deep down, they're very insecure, and acting is almost a way to overcome it. Yeah, it, it, you know, it gives you, I mean, people say to me, are, what way are you, are you Chekhov? Well, Chekhov is very kind of, um, there's a certain bravado about Chekhov. He's you know? a happy guy. Yeah, you know, and I get, to, I get to express those feelings uh, and have the license to express those feelings as Chekhov, where I don't feel comfortable doing it as Walter Koenig because I'm, I feel that if I do that, the other shoe will drop. Hmm. And I've learned to live with it. <laughs> you know, Star Trek is, is a legend, and, it, you know, and don't I achieve some satisfaction from being part of that legend? I don't. I mean, I, I, I like the attention, and I like the recognition, and I like the... Uh, on one, on, on, uh, to, one, to one degree, I like the acclaim. And the other, I feel uncomfortable with it because I don't think a Star Trek has ever been a measure of my ability. 
and that I am so disproportionately lauded, as we all are, for our contributions, uh, doesn't seem right to me. But you like the character. You even did a, a you wrote and performed a... Koenig versus Chekhov, yeah, versus it was a Chekhov. debate. I did that because I, I you know, I'd go to conventions and, uh, and uh, I felt that the audiences were seeing me do the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt that I owed them something other than simply the same anecdotal stories mm -hmm. in, this, in the relating the same news uh, uh, for, from, from, one, uh, from one convention appearance to another. So I came up with this idea of a, a debate uh, between, the, between uh, this, the human being and the alter ego. And uh, it's, it's back and forward. It starts, Trasviti Dvarcha Kakputyeva, it's a topic of today's debate, the human being versus the heroic alter ego. Or more precisely, shall it be better to be a human person and stumble along on a mortal coil spanning three score and ten while experiencing all manner of insufferable indignity, or being the heroic alter ego and soar among the stars in an epic life of mythical proportions? That's the way I start. Wow. <laughs> and then Koenig says, well, hey, wait a second, you know, and they go back and forth and they get into a real argument and uh, citing chapter and verses to who has the better existence. How fun. Yeah, it runs about 15 minutes, and when I remember it all, it's really uh, very entertaining. <laughs> it's great. It was fun to see how quickly you went into Chekhov, yeah, too. Yeah, Bing! Yeah. And the, the whole thing, you just lightened up. Yeah. It's like you took a Chekhov pillar. <laughs> you don't need Prozac. See, well, that's true. That's it. That's what acting is. You, you're taking, a, you're taking a, a Prozac. You're taking a, a pill, you know, that gives you a, a boost, a high. Uh, even when you're playing a, you know, a, a uh, Dostoevsky character, you know, or a, a Chekhovian character, uh, it's the chance to, to escape into this other world and, and, these, uh, and these other people. It's fun. Yeah. It's playing. Yeah. This is uh, from a stage production of The White House Murder Case by Jules Pfeiffer. And uh, it's kind of fun because uh, the Star Trek aficionados will recognize at least two actors who uh, perform uh, on the Star Trek series at one time or another. This is also from the White House murder case. Uh, the other actor is named Richard Fulton. He and I were playing CIA agents who got caught on the battlefield and were the victims of, an, uh, of a poisonous ga gas that uh, caused us to lose body parts and uh, one by one and ultimately we're just two heads on the battlefield. It's all that's left of us. It, it's, 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 it's the, probably the, the, um, the, uh, the, the epitome of black comedy, the uh, quintessential black comedy. Um, people were laughing, but they were also rather shocked by the whole thing. This is a picture from Antony and Cleopatra. It was an Encyclopedia Britannica production for uh, television that uh, we did. I played Pompey, and this is Tony Geary from a General Hospital, uh, and he played uh, Caesar. Dr. Caesar. Dr. Caesar? No, no I'm kidding. It's a General Hospital. Oh, I'm right. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> over and over and over and over again, ad nauseum, I'm asked, what do you, how do you account for the success of Star Trek? That seems to be the most commonly asked question. You know, and I have a fairly rote, uh, automatic pilot kind of answer now that I, I just push a button in my head and I just let the words spew out. Uh, I think that there are myriad component parts to that answer. And I think uh, certainly one aspect of the answer is the innovative science fiction, uh, the good storytelling. Another aspect is that we, we present a future a very positive future. We're not talking Armageddon, as most, most science fiction does. I think uh, well-written characters, I'm talking about Next Generation as well as our show, uh, dimensional relationships. You can like somebody and dislike somebody you know, at the same time. You can have, you know, you, you, things are going on that, 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 that mirror real, real, what really happens in the world between people. Um, I think in our case, also, when we went into syndication and were seen so frequently, we became part of the conscious of the American public. Uh, we became an extended part of the American family. We were, we're seen in their 
kitchens and their bedrooms and their living rooms, you know, uh, to the extent that uh, we really are old friends. And I, with, with, with that comes also a sense, I think, of solidarity. People's lives change in, 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 in many ways during the course of a lifetime. They change jobs, they t change residences, they change mates. And we seven have endured. We seven are still there. And I think there's some comfort in that for people. That here is something that, that is a rock, you know, that, is, that it, it reflects stability, that is a symbol of, uh, of uh, an ongoing uh, process. And I think people feel good about that. Brent Spiner said to an interviewer, it's just very hard to turn down blind adoration. <laughs> I thought that was just the, the nicest way to sum it up. What, what is it for you, the convention? Well, there's certainly that. There's certainly a you know, tremendous amount of support. But I'm never, I'm never, you know, I've never been able to totally, I can't say, I've never been able to totally accept it on those terms. They love you, that's all there is I to know, it. I know, but and at that least... that bothers you so much. No, it's, it doesn't bother me, no. I mean, I, I, it's, it's really nice. It would be but. nicer, it would be nicer if I deserved it. I mean, and I do deserve it if I was given the opportunity. I'm not talking about false humility here. Uh, I would just wish that the work was worthy of the, re of the reaction. Okay, all right. And, the, and, and it's not because I am not up to the challenge, it's because I haven't been given the opportunity. Well, you've done a few things. Star Trek Four, you got to yeah. fall off a yeah, I got, uh, aircraft carrier. There's a couple of nice moments in there. That's why it's the f my fondest uh, memory. Are we done now? May I go? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean that was fun. There was yeah. some. No, I, no, I did enjoy that. I thought there were a couple of scenes that really played well, and I felt comfortable and good about them. I felt certain pride. You did at a convention. You told me about this on the phone when we talked about the interview. Uh, a play called Rats in the Wall. I did a reading from a short story called Rats in the Wall by H.P. Lovecraft. And it, there were people, <laughs> you moved the audience. I it moved was. the yeah, it was a very, very effective piece. I mean, it, it's almost a, it's almost a, a built in. You, you, you can't, you, it's very difficult to fail with this piece. And at the same time, I felt I had a, 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 a propensity for doing it well. Uh, but it's about a guy who uh, buys an old mansion that, that overlooks, a, that sits on a cliff and he feels compelled to start investigating the subcellars. And the deeper he goes into this, he, be, he finds uh, signs of ancient civilizations and ancient relig religions going past even the Druids to some very barbaric prehistoric ritual. Uh, and as he descends through this, through these various subcellars, he regresses as a human being. And uh, it, it's a very effective piece until he's talking in tongues and, and you know and making sounds that are uh, you know very eerie and spooky and not and not intelligible. Uh, and I, I did it at, at, at one convention in, in a cabaret, and <laughs> some lady uh, evidently got really spooked and started uh, calling out uh, the, the name of uh, Christ and in the name of Christ uh, we must destroy this man. <laughs> she thought I, I was thought, possessed. Oh she thought I was, I was possessed by the devil. And in fact, she had told an usher, she had asked an usher how to get backstage because she had to hurt me. <laughs> oh she had to God. inflict pain. So I felt, gee, I must be very effective, you know, if, uh, if I can move somebody to feel, uh, you know, that strongly. Talk to me about Gene Roddenberry. Did you have any contact with Gene? I liked him. In general, I liked him. I thought he was a, it was a, he was a good guy. I respected his vision, his sense of vision, and his determination. Uh, he would not compromise. He found it very hard to compromise. And early on, it, was, it, it, was, it would appear to have been self-destructive because he, he had a couple of series pilots that uh, went before the cameras that he uh, actually withdrew from because the, the network insisted on changing uh, actors and uh, on changing characters and not following uh, what he wanted, yeah, and his vision. But what happened was that it seemed, you know, sometimes things come around. 
he, I'm sure he developed that reputation as somebody who you could not, you could not get to uh, compromise. And, and, and if, oh, at first they just canceled shows on him because of that. When it came to doing Next Generation, I think the, the, the studio knew that this was not, what he said was not an empty threat, or was not an empty gesture, that they had to take him literally. And if he said he wanted it this way, it had to be that way. Good, bad, or indifferent, if they wanted the show, they'd have to do it his way. It's not very often you bring a, a studio as, as uh, huge as Paramount to its knees, but I think in effect he did that. George Takei. He's a friend. We have, a, you know, we have good times together. Uh, we, uh, I think I probably talked to George more than anybody else about Star Trek and about the phenomenon and, uh, and our place in it. Um, George has always, uh, uh, I admire George's ability uh, to, to, comport, to comport himself in a very professional manner, even when he was disappointed uh, on, in the kinds of roles that he was offered. Do you want to be captain? I've said when people ask me, do I want to be captain? I said, you can break me to Ensign, throw me in the brig, and give me a seven minute soliloquy, and I'll be as pleased as can be, you know? <laughs> Just, just give me some wine. Yeah, just give me something to do. Um, although I have suggested to the uh, next generation people that they could just, for fun, to throw in. Uh, there's a place where a bunch of journalists are, are trying to get our attention. Uh, Kirk, Scotty, and Chekhov. And if somebody were to yell, Captain Chekhov, and just let it go by. It'd be fun. It would be fun. And, you, the, uh, and all the fans out there would say, huh? When did he become captain, you know? Sometime between Star Trek VI and Star Trek VII. Hundred and four, yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's kind of neat. Do you have a favorite episode? There are probably four or five of the television episodes which are my favorites, and they all have a, uh, they have all have a common denominator, I think. Spectre of the Gun, uh, Who Mourns for Adonais, I Mud, and Trouble with Tribbles. Because I, I had something to do! I, had, I got a chance to work! I do feel one thing. I think that if we had, this is just the sense I have, and I have nothing to substantiate it with, but if we had gone five years, if, we, if, it, wasn't, if it wasn't network interrupt us, uh, maybe we would have out lived our welcome. As it was, we, we were, it was an aborted uh, program. We were, we, were, we were taken out too quickly. And uh, had, had we run those five years, maybe there never would have been a call for us to come back. Was it lean for you after Star Trek? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was quite lean. Um, in my best year, <laughs> of course, we're talking about a different uh, economic scale and a different standard of living back in 1969, 1970. But in my best year, I, I earned $11,000 on Star Trek, make, doing Star Trek. Not $11,000 a week, $11,000 for the entire season. But with reruns, I was able to get by for a couple of years. About 1973, I hit rock bottom when my daughter was born, and I was really broke. I was living on unemployment insurance and seriously considering um, getting a job driving a hack or something of that nature. Uh, Gene came through at that point, by the way. Uh, unsolicited, he um, wrote me into a two-hour television movie, uh, which was to be a pilot for a series. So that, that was helpful. And then I started writing, and uh, writing for television. And I sold four or five shows. What did you write? I wrote, uh, the first show I wrote that I sold was um, uh, an anthology series called The Class of 65. And it was an episode of that. Then I, uh, from that I went to write a f an episode of Family. Uh, somewhere in between I wrote A Land of the Lost for Saturday morning. I wrote a, an episode of the Star Trek animated series. I had a couple of uh, movie scripts optioned. And in fact, uh, NBC optioned a script of mine and then re-optioned it for a second six months and then failed to make it ultimately. But that was a considerable hunk of change, uh, just those options. So that was great for you. Yeah, and I wrote a, 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 a Incredible Hulk episode that was never produced, but I was paid uh, full the full amount for. Interspersed were a few 
who are a few television shows like, um, oh God, Ironsides and Medical Center and, and a couple of sh other shows like that during that period. Do you write under your name or do you use a Oh no, I write under my name. Let's talk a little bit about the animated series then. You wrote an episode. The toughest writing I've ever done. Uh, really? Yeah. My idea was to clone Spock. This was before cloning was really being a given. Yeah, yeah a big hit in 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 in, uh, in the film. Uh, I mean, it had been in the papers, but it, it had not right. yet become a big thing. And uh, but Gene wanted me to put in talking vegetables, and uh, since it was animation, there was so much more we could do. So I had you know asparagus that uh, you know that has spouted very prophetic uh, comments and. Uh, I did about nine or ten or eleven uh, takes on the script, and I was going crazy. And in fact, when I finally finished and I handed in the last draft, uh, and I was, I was invited to write a second episode, I demurred. I said, I, I don't want to do anymore. I, it was too much work, it would, and, it, and it wasn't all that gratifying. I mean, after all, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm writing for little pencil drawings on acetate, you know, and I, it just wasn't, wasn't that much fun. But now you're doing comics. That's a different thing entirely. Um, Superheroes. Well, Raver, yeah. Uh, this, is, this is my creation. Uh, and uh, the, the great fun about writing a comic book like this is that I can do uh, on between 22 pages, which what it would cost millions and millions of dollars to do if you were to make it into a script, you know, make it into a feature film. I can create worlds that, uh, you know, that, have, that have no boundaries. Uh, the way my, my character is set up, uh, he, can, he can appear in, in, uh, in, in an historical setting, he can appear in a parallel universe, he can appear in a fairy tale land. And in fact, that's what my third story was about, uh, with allegory and metaphor uh, in, involved as well. And uh, with a sense of humor and with a lot of action, a lot of visuals. Uh, I'm having a ball doing this. Um, Your family, you have a daughter? I have a daughter, Danielle, who's 21 years old and is an actress. She's very good. She's an extremely bright young lady. Um, she is doing sketch comedy. Uh, my son is an actor. Uh, he appeared on the television series for three years. He moved to Vancouver subsequently and was trying to put together some film projects on his own, writing and, uh, and uh, assembling a, a company of, of performers and, and uh, people behind the scenes and um, worked very diligently at that. Did they start as children acting? Or? No. Uh, well, my, my daughter did a Simon and Simon when she was about 12. Uh, my, they both acted in school, and they both showed, uh, they, they both, uh, showed evidence of talent very early on. Did you encourage them, or did you go, oh, no, don't? No, no. Be a physicist. No. I didn't. I, we, neither, we neither pushed or, or uh, cautioned them. We just let them, we gave them their own heads. They saw what was happening. They saw the, 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 the times here at home when things were going badly, uh, when, uh, you know, when uh, the work wasn't plentiful. They had a sense, you know, they knew that it wasn't a, you know, a garden of roses, uh, the acting profession. My wife, Judy, Judy Levitt is a professional name. She's an actress. Uh, she's been an actress since we've you know, known each other. She's done a lot of theater. She, I think la last year she did a, six plays, I think. Uh, she works constantly. I know I met her at a Christmas party, and I asked her to do a scene with me for a uh, professional workshop a company. Did you really want to do the scene? Or yeah, just yeah, no, I come really over did. My place where we no, I really wanted to do the scene, and we did it from uh, from the play Winter Set, and they and they accepted us both into the into the uh, theater, into the theater uh, workshop. Um, in fact, we didn't start dating until well after we had done the scene, which is very strange. Would you change any of it? Would you trade any of them? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I don't know what else I could have done that, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, Paul, I can't tell you the depths that an actor falls to when things go badly. I mean, you know, we, we know about, you know, the, the great highs, but, and it's 
devastating. It's emotionally uh, devastating to feel so, uh, to be so wholly rejected. You know, m most people in, in a profession, when their work is rejected, it's a part of them that's rejected. You know, it's, it's their ability to, you know, to use their motor skill or ability to do, you know, to, to, to hand in a script or whatever. But an actor, it's his entire persona, it's his entire being that's and When they say, we don't want you, they're saying, we don't want you. We don't want the, the, you know, the totality of you. And um, that can be really, uh, particularly if you really care and you really want it, that can be just so destructive and, and so painful. So what do you say to somebody who says, oh, I want to be an actor, I want to be an actress? I say, you've got to really care. You've got to really want it. Uh, and, a, and have to be prepared, and, and you don't know this. I mean, it's easy to say you have to be prepared to suffer uh, disillusionment and disappointment, and but nobody knows if they really are. Until uh, they go through it. Until they go through it, right. You, uh, you, you, you might say you have a passion for the craft, and, then, uh, and that passion may be, may be your downfall, because you care so much that the, the, the pain of rejection becomes unbearable, and then you start popping pills or drinking or whatever it is that people do who can't deal with the reality. How do you deal with it? Well, I think I, I, I dealt with it by uh, uh, forming plaque on my arteries, <laughs> you know, and uh, suffering a heart attack when I was 56 years old. So you internalized it as much? Yeah, I internalized it a lot. I, I, I scream sometimes, but, uh, but I've, uh, I've never had a really constructive way of handling it. But your marriage has been there. Yeah, my wife has been supportive. We've had our, you know, we've had our problems as every marriage does. Um, my, you know, I, I love my family. They're, they're, you know, they're all good people, very worthwhile people. And I, I derive comfort in that. And when I was ill, they, were, they all came, you know, they all came to my side. They all flew out, saw me in Chicago. And that was very, uh, very important to me. Uh, Yes, my family is definitely a, a, a strong point, and very supportive. Is there anything you would add to your plate, if you could? Well, I, it's, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have a, I'm not burning to, uh, to direct theater again, but I would like to. I would like to direct theater. I, I, I feel that there, again, there is, I have some talent in that area, and, it's, and I feel it can be very creative being a director. What makes a good director? Well, one thing he has to be able to do, uh, at least the, w the way I operate, is I take my cue from the actors. Uh, I don't impose my uh, sensibilities on the actors, but I try to find what they have to offer that we can embellish on, and that we can draw out, and that we can elaborate on. Because if you, if you try to impose your, your values and, and your sense of what is right, then it becomes artificial for the actor. You know, he's, he's starting to imitate or he's trying to, to you know, to, to, to reach for something that isn't part of him. But if you find, if you have the, you know, you have the ability to, the, the insight into a performer and, and see something in him that is, that is something unique and say, now, what you did there was great. Let's, let's work more on that. Let's bring that out. Then he, not only does he feel that he's making his own, making a contribution and it's his own personal comment that he's making, but uh, it, it also is more truthful. This is kind of a Barbara Walters question, but I'm going to ask it, and we can throw it out if we don't like it. But what do you want to be best remembered as? Well, the truth of the matter is that I think the, the highest uh, art form anyone could achieve is, 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 is as a writer. I'm hoping that, you know, if I continue to pursue writing, that I will, that I will accomplish something worthwhile where it's Walter Koenig, the writer, and also acted, and incidentally on Star Trek, you know, that would be, that would be, uh, I guess, the highest form of tribute that I feel I, I could be paid. Before we go, I'd like to thank Walter Koenig for spending time with us today. I'd like to thank his family for putting up with me and the film crew for the several hours we were at his house. And most importantly, I'd like to thank you for watching. I'm Paul Rosa, and I'm looking forward to our next conversation.